And good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our session, uh, OneTrust and Okta Leveraging Privacy and Identity for Data Protection Operations. Uh, my name is Jeff Barnett, and we are gonna be spending the next 45 minutes or so talking through a number of things around uh, providing the uh, background for the California Consumer Privacy Act, uh, what challenges are that face digital businesses today in relation to that uh, new regulatory compliance, uh, how Okta and OneTrust are working together with a joint solution, and then follow that up with a customer case study. So thank you very much for joining today. Uh, once again, I'm Jeff Barnett. I'm the Global Head of Technology Partners here at OneTrust, which is uh, all the tech partners uh, roll up underneath my team to be able to do that. And we work with a number of partners uh, in conjunction to provide value to our end customers, similar to Okta. For those of you who are not familiar with OneTrust, I uh, wanted to take you through a little bit of a background about who we are as a company, what we do, uh, and why this is relevant for you and your strategy around privacy and consent. So OneTrust is the world's most widely used platform to manage both privacy, security, and trust. Uh, we are number one in market share for consent management platforms. And what we really do is that we are a purpose-built solution to help companies operationalize and manage their compliance for CCPA, GDPR, and hundreds of the different world's privacy, security, and compliance laws and frameworks. So some of those uh, ISO 27001, uh, NIST frameworks. Uh, we have a number of ones that you can manage through that platform as well. Uh, we have, uh, as a company, we have grown to over 5,000 customers, uh, both big and small. So both very large enterprises use us all the way down to uh, companies that are much smaller. They're all able to leverage that, the same platform to be able to do that. We're in 100 countries uh, and essentially kind of global operations around the world. We have 1,500 employees of which we invest aggressively back into the platform and over 500 of those are in our product and R&D teams to really kind of help us stay on top of what's new, helping our customers and making sure that you can get access to that information uh, as quickly as you need. Uh, we are headquartered in Atlanta with a uh, co-headquarters in London as well. And then we also have in-country operations kind of around the world uh, to help support you uh, both within uh, North America, South America, EMEA, and then Asia Pacific uh, as well. So that's a little bit about OneTrust. Uh, and if you haven't heard of us, um, happy to, to kind of talk to you uh, a bit more about how we can help you out. So let's kind of go ahead and dive right into uh, what is the California Consumer Privacy Act, uh, what are some of the implications for business and what you can do as, uh, as some best practices to help you out. So let's just kind of level set first on kind of what the law is. So as many of you may know, a lot of people have heard of GDPR in Europe. Uh, within the state of California, uh, CCPA has been a law that if you go back a couple of years, uh, the law was signed uh, right around mid uh, 2018. Uh, with subsequent uh, steps kind of along the way with the California Attorney General, uh, the governor kind of signing that into law, and then really kind of the start of the first implementation of that here uh, in January uh, of 20, January 1st uh, in 2020. Uh, so where those laws in conjunction with that, as well as other privacy regulations kind of around the globe, you start to see kind of an evolving regulatory landscape that's happening to where uh, consumers, and all of us, of course, are consumers, start to have more control of the information that you have and how you interact with businesses digitally and what uh, are some of those rights that you have. So if we talk about kind of who does that apply to, uh, there's really kind of three uh, general constituents. So the first, of course, is consumers, right? So uh, the law defines consumers as uh, a natural person who is a California resident, right? Uh, so uh, for those familiar with GDPR, it's the same concept as the data subject. Uh, in California, it's referred to as the consumer. From a business standpoint, 
it's not just businesses that are based in the state of California. It's essentially anyone that collects personal information, discloses personal information uh, to service providers or sells that personal information for consumers that are California residents. Uh, those are the businesses that are going to be impacted. So essentially, if you look at that, uh, you know, virtually uh, anyone doing business or, or certainly uh, with California residents that are out there, this will apply to you. So, you know, most digital properties, certainly within the United States and then and more expansively beyond that, uh, have applicability here to the CCPA. And as you look at kind of employees, that is something that is not specifically covered on the January 1st deadline, but it will be addressed uh, at a later date. Uh, if you are familiar with GDPR, certainly there are very specific rights that employees have around the access uh, of, of their data uh, in their employment relationship with their employer. So let's talk about uh, some of the major themes and what are those consumer rights that you actually have now as a consumer. So there are really kind of four main rights to do that. So let me take each one of these individually and, and kind of dive in a little bit to this. So you have the right to disclosure. So the right to disclosure is uh, as a consumer, how do you have to gain access to your information and have uh, that particular company that you're doing business with to be able to disclose that information about you, what they are collecting about you, how they are using it. The right to deletion on the second one there is uh, essentially your right as a consumer to say, at any time I may decide that I don't want that particular company uh, that I have been doing business with in the past, uh, to essentially forget my information and delete that information. And so uh, that company is required and obligated by the law to delete that information. There are a few exceptions and we'll kind of go into that uh, a little bit later on. Uh, the third is the right to opt out. So you can opt out of the sale of your information uh, at any time on that site, whether that uh, most companies uh, talk to that as, as it relates to cookies or uh, you know, opting out of other practices uh, that uh, they are collecting information about you there as well. And the fourth right is the right to non-discrimination. So it, as a consumer, if you exercise kind of, you know, these critical rights that you have, you can't be discriminated against as a consumer. So they can't, that digital business can't treat you differently than they are treating their other customers if you choose to uh, you know, gain access to your information, delete your information, or opt out of sale of that particular information. All right, so now that we've kind of gotten grounded a little bit on what is the CCPA, who it applies to, and what the rights are, let's talk a little bit about you as a business and what are some of the key challenges that you face uh, going into this and how does that affect things uh, both operationally and technically uh, to be able to do that? So if you look at that, a lot of, there's really kind of two primary challenges. So one is as a brand, now that these consumers have these individual rights, they're more educated, they're understanding some of the choices that they can make. What does that mean around how do you build brand trust and loyalty around your digital property? And so what does that mean to consumers uh, to where you know, they have the, the ability to change their preferences, change their consent about what they're doing. And so how are you able to then leverage that? And what we see a lot of our smart brands doing is actually changing that into a conversation where they are engaging their customers more and showing them what kind of value that they get about sharing information about them and why that's valuable. And so they're using that as a mechanism to really drive a lot more loyalty and trust in their brand to be able to do that. On the technical side of things, uh, you know, certainly there is, you know, being able to, you know, find out where your data is, where the information that you have internally within an enterprise uh, that has private information about individuals, uh, what information may be accessed, how do you access that? And then how do you index that information to where it's easily retrievable to where you have information about a specific individual. Uh, and so you know, most companies, the way that they have a lot of their uh, data organized today is that they are kind of at an application level, but not specifically indexed to how do you figure out uh, 
all the information about a specific individual that's exercising their rights to be able to do that. So as we look at those challenges uh, a little bit more, uh, here are kind of the, the bigger ones as you start getting into some of these privacy and consent use cases uh, that we often hear from our customers there as well. So uh, the first is how to intake and process consumer requests. So this is, uh, what mechanism do you use? How do you use that across uh, different channels that you may be collecting that consent, whether that's on the web, whether that's on mobile, uh, whether that's on things like smart TVs. Uh, so how do you do that? Uh, the second one, and, and very important certainly to uh, Okta users and the Okta customer base is, how do you actually verify the identity of that individual? How do you know that it's not someone else within the same family that's asking for that information? How do you ensure that it's not a fraudster asking uh, for that information? Because as a consumer, if you have a right now to retrieve that information uh, back about you, some of that can be very sensitive information. And so uh, how do you verify that identity? And then what is the right level of assurance matching kind of the sensitivity of the data uh, to being able to verify and potentially authenticate those users uh, is very important uh, to do that. The third part is to how to track third parties I've shared or sold information to. So a lot of companies in the past maybe uh, had business relationships, but not really a program to track where does that information go? Um, how are folks using it? And so uh, where the CCPA has really kind of shed uh, or shine a light on some of the practices, uh, at least as far as just being able to understand who those third parties are and what types of relationships you have as a company with them. The fourth one is how to notify third parties of opt-out or deletion requests. So if you have a consumer that does exercise their rights, uh, how do you let those third parties that you do have sharing uh, information agreements with, how do you actually let them know that uh, that particular consumer doesn't want you to have that information shared anymore. Uh, how do you do that? So that both uh, equates to uh, things for uh, such as cookies and uh, advertising technology companies. So letting them know those signals further down that uh, that individual doesn't want to be targeted ads to. Uh, and then it can be other types of situations. So for example, the travel industry to where uh, airlines and uh, rental cars and car services and hotels share information about individuals through consent. And so if an individual changes that consent, then how does that affect some of the downstream partners as well? Okay. And so you can see as those kind of get multiple levels down, those can get quite complex from an operational perspective to uh, be able to, to track and identify those processes. The fifth one is how to handle opt-out of sale requests when a consumer opts out, right? So this is more of uh, what happens primarily from a cookie collection, uh, what happens there? Most folks know that uh, Google has announced, uh, at least as far as uh, third-party cookies and kind of sunsetting some of those. And so how to handle some of those opt-out of sale requests are of top of mind for all the downstream partners that really kind of help tailor personalized experience and advertising uh, on a number of sites. And the last one there is, how to manage and update your privacy notices. So you as a company are responsible and, and many of us have seen that. So typically if you kind of scroll to the bottom of any website that you go to, you'll typically see a link for a privacy policy. Those need to be updated in a timely manner. And so for, uh, for the most simplistic cases, uh, that's very simple if you just have a single site. Uh, many companies have multiple domains or they may have multiple domains in different languages that service the needs of different countries and different languages uh, that have different requirements for how often they need to update those privacy notices. Uh, so how to do that and how to do that in an efficient manner uh, while still understanding the unique needs of each individual jurisdiction is something uh, that takes into place. And so, so we often see this as, as a number of challenges for uh, companies to, to kind of set up their program uh, from a privacy perspective. So then kind of moving in is from a consumer rights and a legal requirements perspective, uh, what are some of the things that then if we kind of go to that next level down, how does that kind of affect your workflow as a company that is providing these services around consent? So 
If someone comes in to do a, a consumer rights request, uh, here's what you need to do as a company. So you have to offer that individual two or more methods uh, to actually request uh, those consumer rights. So typically people do that in app, on a mobile app or through a website, but you need more than one method. So not everyone has access to that. So uh, toll free number is a requirement for that. And there are a few other methods uh, that are available to do that. Uh, the second part of that is then if someone requests for their information, what's the time frame? So that delivery of personal information needs to happen within 45 days. It must be provided free of charge and it can actually be extended to an additional 45 days if you're providing notice uh, for those particular consumers. The third part of that is how do you actually verify that consumer request? So how do you actually verify that that's coming from a legitimate source uh, to be able to do that? So there are some identity checks that you can do in there as an example. Uh, the fourth part is you must not require account creation, right? So we talked about initially about uh, a right that you had as an individual uh, around not being able to be discriminated against. So if you do not have an account, uh, that brand can't force you into creating an account for that. Now, obviously, if you have one already, uh, that's very helpful as it uh, helps that company identify you as an individual even more, but you can't actually require that account creation at that point. The fifth part of that is you must notify third parties of the information that's been disclosed or sold to from a deletion only perspective. You have to provide disclosure up to twice in 12 months. So uh, this is uh, put in place to where as a consumer, you can do it twice within 12 months. Uh, obviously more than that uh, is, is deemed unnecessary, but that's a right that your customers can exercise up to twice a month. You have to provide them 12 months of information uh, kind of in arrears on that, right? So from a look back perspective, you need to have at least that last 12 months there. And then there are a few exceptions to deletion. Uh, so I won't hit on all of those today, but as an example of that, uh, one would be legal compliance, right? So if you are actively involved in a lawsuit, that lawsuit is requiring record retention. Uh, for example, a party of that lawsuit can't come in and, and tell you to delete that information, right? So you actually have a legal obligation to do that. Uh, there's research in the public interest. So essentially research primarily around like scientific research that an individual has opted into already, or it's part of a transactional records, right? So for example, uh, if you uh, have a relationship with your bank, you ask your bank to delete the information, they obviously still need to maintain a certain level of information that you have because you still have an account there. Uh, so they're not totally deleting the information to be able to uh, comply with the contract. All right, so as we move on, let's kind of talk about as you as a practice internally, then what does that mean for your operational uh, considerations? And so these are some of the top considerations that we see customers from an operational perspective go through and do. So one is routing, like routing requests. So how do you dynamically route that request based on what type of consumer they are. Are they a paying consumer? Are they a non-paying consumer? Do they have an account? Do they not have an account? So there are different workflows uh, with potentially different levels of information depending on who that customer is and what type of information they have. Uh, so how do you route that? From an automation perspective, uh, obviously the end goal is that uh, while there are some very complex backend and there are exceptions to some of these rules that we kind of talked about before, how do you go through and automate those processes as much so they don't become a uh, burdensome uh, on the workforce to be able to have to staff up a massive amount of staff to do that? So how do you actually automate those requests where you can? How do you actually communicate back with the consumer, right? So if once they've made the request, 45 days is, that could be a lengthy amount of time. Uh, and so how do you provide templates to where you can kind of keep the communication consistent across there because this is now a regulated activity uh, to be able to do this, to comply. And then uh, the fourth one is how do you make it secure, right? So how do you actually give a secure method to when you actually respond back with what is by its own nature, uh, private information? How do you make sure that you can, are delivering that to the right customer and you are delivering it securely so that 
only that individual can see that. And then kind of the lastly, uh, there is how do you actually track the metrics for process improvement, right? So how do you make, um, how do you track all of these? How do you understand exceptions? How do you understand what are the things that kind of trip you up and are able to create KPIs for your own internal team to then make you much more effective to be able to do that? So then the most important thing of all is how do you actually maintain the customer experience across all the platforms and do that together? And so, you know, as part of that, that's really where Okta and OneTrust working together. That's where we really work together in conjunction with each other to help you streamline the consent management uh, process and how do we actually help you improve that user experience so that not only do you meet compliance, but you're also adding value into your customers as well. So let me kind of dive into that a little bit more. So from a OneTrust perspective, uh, the product that we have for this is called Preference Choice. And essentially that is a, uh, it's, a it's an integrated, it's a modular privacy management software for consent. Uh, kind of the category of the market that that plays in is a consent management platform. And so if you look at what the platform does, it really is a purpose-built solution to really help you manage that end-to-end -end process. So how do you do mobile app scanning and consent? So this is detecting within your mobile app where data is going and what is required to uh, manage consent. Mobile apps can be uh, somewhat unique in the fact that you typically are uh, leveraging the location ability within the app to do some interesting features around there. Uh, and so that's typically somewhat unique uh, versus uh, other types of channels that you have there. We have a universal consent and preference uh, module within there. So how can you actually create a, a system of records specifically for your consent and preference information to then make that available, not only for to check at any individual time, what is the current status of an individual, but then what are the hundreds of applications that you have within your system to make sure that those are up to date, right? So for example, your CRM system, you know, can I contact this individual or not? Uh, all the marketing systems that you have, uh, other HR type systems uh, there as well. And so this is kind of a central way for you to be able to pull that information together. The third part is we've kind of touched on as well, which is how do you help consumers uh, actually fulfill uh, their consumer rights request. And so we take that through the full life cycle. We'll dig into that in more detail here in the presentation on how that works and how, how that actually works with Okta and OneTrust together. Uh, there is a policy and notice management uh, module on there to where we make it very easy for a business user to then be able to update a privacy policy and be able to propagate that out automatically without getting an IT or a web team uh, out to the available sites across domains and languages to be able to do that. And then from a cookie compliance perspective, uh, all the way from how do you manage and build a good user experience around collecting uh, cookie consent. So I think everyone at this point has seen those cookie banners, but also more importantly, how do you then take that information about what an individual has exercised their rights and make sure that you've updated all the downstream advertising and, and marketing providers to make sure that they are aware of what that individual is and what they are allowing you to uh, be able to uh, track about that individual. So that's one trust preference choice. Where we come in together is we talk about where the intersection of Okta and OneTrust is, it's around the user experience of the application itself. So whether that is a mobile application, whether that is a web application, in conjunction, both of us work together and it's really around the user experience. And so we talk about this as the human approach to privacy and consent, right? So how can I use that as an engagement strategy for my individual customers? So together, what we do with Okta is we leverage the ability to gather consent. We store those user preferences and what they've chosen to do in the consent in a single source of truth. We connect with other subsystems and services to make sure that they are all updated and in sync as well. Uh, the fourth thing we do is help you manage interactions with 
social identity providers. So these are uh, things like logging in with a Google or a Facebook account to your applications as well, and what type of consent uh, information gets propagated through there. And then how do you purge user data as required by law? And so that's where kind of OneTrust and Okta really make that experience top notch. So let me kind of go in a little bit further on that about how we make that privacy experience uh, across multiple use cases. So uh, assuming you are attending Octane as, a, as an Okta uh, customer and or user, uh, there are really kind of two primary things uh, uh, for the customer identity solution on the Okta side or the workforce identity solution and how that maps to the OneTrust platform. So let me kind of talk about some of those use cases. So the consumer rights use case uh, is around capturing kind of that request for information or, or that deletion request. And so we work with Okta to actually get right there in the app itself, right? So Okta helps validate that user identity for individuals that have uh, a username and password and kind of log into the system. Uh, from a right to deletion, you know, certainly we look to remove some of that user identity and data to be able to do that. From a consent and preference perspective, it's very important to know at any point what information that individual has consented into or any type of preference information uh, that we collect at the same time. So preference information, for example, may be, uh, I only wanna be marketed to on a weekly basis as opposed to a monthly or uh, a daily basis, or I only want to have special offers as opposed to the newsletter. Uh, so those would be preference information. Uh, so what we do is we have an integration with Okta's universal directory to where uh, we can sync with the OneTrust system and make sure that the rich profile information that Okta has about an individual user is synced up with the OneTrust system around what is that current posture for an individual that has consented into that information, okay? So those are two use cases that we have around customer identity. From a workforce identity perspective, uh, I think most folks are aware of enterprise single sign-on. So that is, you know, OneTrust is, you know, you're using OneTrust as, a, as an application internally uh, to do, you know, kind of a SAML single sign-on to get into that. More importantly though, from a data mapping uh, perspective, one of the things that we can do is really help you automate that process. And so what a lot of customers struggle with is understanding what are the applications within my environment that I know private you know, uh, information about individuals uh, and that personal information there. And so uh, there's an integration that OneTrust and Okta has together to where we can use that application catalog that sits within your workforce identity and then map that into the OneTrust system to gain better access to where where that application and data about private information is stored uh, and makes that process uh, very automated to do that and saves a considerable amount of time uh, for uh, our joint customers there. So let me do this. Let me, let me go in and hit one of those use cases that we see over and over again. So this is a use case that each individual company needs to do. Uh, so let's actually go in and, and dive into how OneTrust and Okta are working together around capturing a consumer rights request. So within the OneTrust system, the OneTrust system manages kind of that full end to end from collection to the workflow, to all the back end things that need to happen uh, back to the user uh, once they actually request uh, information about themselves or a deletion request. So, so let's kind of talk through an example where a consumer comes to the site and, and they request information and say, tell me everything that you know about me. So what we do there is, is that particular form uh, is collected, that's collected uh, through the OneTrust system. It can be over phone, email, or on the web, or a mobile application at this point. So once that individual has asked for their information, the second point of that is, <coughs> excuse me, how do you triage and actually validate that that's a legitimate request, right? So, you know, if you recall, an individual can't make more than two requests per year. So there's a check for that. Uh, and then as an Okta uh, customer as well, what we're able to do is that if that individual has a 
uh, a login or an active user account within the Okta system, we can have that user log in to verify their identity uh, in a similar way. If you have even more sensitive information, we actually have a number of other partners that you can then go out and do a more in-depth identity verification process with there as well. Most folks find, and for most use cases, leveraging kind of their current process for access and authentication with the Okta system satisfies the need to identify that particular individual making the request. Once that request then gets fulfilled uh, and everything looks good and says, yes, this is a legitimate request. Yes, this is the person. And now how do we actually go retrieve that information? We do a couple of things there. So we leverage what's called one trust targeted data discovery, which is essentially the ability to make a call out to all the systems that you have within your environment that know about information about that individual, both structured and unstructured, pull that information back and also send some of those signals to third party vendors as they may have information about, consolidate all that information together and bring it back for the individual. So then the fourth step then is how do I then actually respond back to that user? So there is a console within uh, the OneTrust system that helps a customer service rep typically uh, communicate back out with the individual. Uh, yes, we're still processing. Yes, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, so it's, it's a very templatized process. They can keep that uh, standard across uh, or as standard as possible across all other consumers. Once we get all that information, then we can fulfill that all the way back to the individual. So by its nature, since a lot of this is very uh, sensitive information or can be sensitive information, the user provided through the OneTrust uh, platform uh, an encrypted messaging portal, right? So that individual is typically emailed a link, they click on a link and we'll take them back into uh, an encrypted portal to where they can access that information and we just don't give that information uh, or send it out uh, at that point. And then the last part of that is on the OneTrust system as well, we have all the record keeping that you need. So it's not just uh, what is your consent at any particular point, but it is also a timeline of that consent. How has that individual updated that over time uh, and all the record keeping that you would need for either an internal auditor or regulator uh, if they came uh, to be able to do that. So that's the consumer rights request. So let's dig into that a little bit more closely here and look at how that actually happens uh, within the Okta and OneTrust system. So at a high level, uh, that consumer comes in. So this is a, uh, a first time registration of an individual. That individual comes in and that is the perfect place to collect whatever their initial consent is. So. That consent is captured through the app. In this example, uh, Okta through the Okta system is actually capturing that consent. It's stored in Okta, updated in the directory, and then Okta is updating and syncing uh, OneTrust via a webhook to make that happen. And then OneTrust uh, updates Okta around all the other updates that need to happen for that particular individual uh, there as well. So as we move on, there's really kind of two use cases. So there's one is, what is the registration use case? Uh, and so uh, how does that consent get captured up front? So this is kind of a, you know, as an example, someone is registering for a calendar app. And so this is a explicit opt-in that happens. There's also kind of the consent of the downstream application. So this is a, uh, a calendar application that happens. And, and so this is then, how does that consent uh, happen as that goes further downstream uh, to be able to do that? And whether you're allowing that downstream application to capture additional information about you. So all of that uh, you get today and, and a lot of that is in Okta today around that. And so the Okta and OneTrust systems then are kind of synced to be able to do that, right? So as a uh, system to actually then manage the consent part of that user profile, uh, capturing that and building kind of that rich uh, user profile is very important. So very much the same way that you do that within the directory uh, today for uh, the Okta directory. 
all of those attributes about the user and any individual one point in time, uh, what is there. And so that's where on the back end, we sync with the one trust system uh, as the system of record for consent and as those change there. And then how does that change on a request uh, for the consent for the downstream application there as well? Uh, so you get that to where within Okta, you have a customizable UI, you have an admin UI as well to manage some of those, and then a standard integration to where that directory part then comes in and whether that's for a downstream app and that consent, uh, then how does that get uh, replicated within the one trust system there to then manage all of the consent uh, from, from that point on. At the end of the day, what effectively as a customer and, and we're all uh, aligned to, how do you give a, a your customer uh, control over their personal data uh, around that? How do you comply uh, with the regulations? And so how do you have kind of that single source of truth? And so at any point, you may have a your sales team that is running a campaign to where uh, they are calling individual users. And so uh, you have all the backend applications that need to be synced up. So uh, your Salesforce CRM. Uh, how are you going to run uh, an email marketing campaign or promote a particular webinar? Has that individual uh, actually opted in to receive that information? It's very important to know all of that for all those use cases uh, at any particular time. And that's where Okta and OneTrust working together uh, can really help you uh, as a customer to do that. So let me do this. Let me uh, kind of dive in a little bit to uh, a customer case study uh, that we had. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, this is a joint customer, both for OneTrust and Okta. Uh, they're a major hotel chain. Uh, where they leverage the one trust privacy and consent solution in conjunction with uh, both Okta's customer and workforce identity. So one of the important things for this particular uh, hotel chain was that uh, with their loyalty customers, their loyalty customers obviously have the highest value, uh, the most repeat business, uh, they're the most discerning customers, both when it comes to what are they consenting into, but also what is uh, preference information about them? <coughs> so one trust acts as the system of record, uh, both for consent and preferences. So an example of consent would be, you know, do you give permission for the hotel to send you an offer, right? So this was, you know, maybe they're running promotion on discounted hotel rooms at a slow period of the year or uh, those types of things. The from a preference perspective, in addition to that, this is where a lot of the customer engagement comes in is, is that at the same time, capturing information about you as a customer. So uh, an example of a preference is, do you like feather pillows? Um, do you often dine at the sushi restaurant, right? So they can more personalize that experience once you get to uh, that particular hotel chain. So when, you know, prior to working with one Trust and Okta, this hotel chain really had, you know, as they looked to comply originally with GDPR and then with CCPA, they really kind of had three challenges. And this is where both One Trust and Okta came together around that. So the first part was, how do you actually verify the identity for a consumer rights request? So it was uh, a, a, a lot of concern. You may have seen some uh, news reports where uh, this is uh, hackers have tried to kind of leverage this as a new fraud channel. So they were very concerned around verifying the identity for of individuals making these consumer rights requests. The second one was around knowing kind of what data and systems to pull data about the user, right? So uh, they obviously knew all the applications that they had, uh, but data, as as you know, can be stored anywhere today. Uh, on prem, it can be stored. Uh, with service providers uh, can be stored in kind of cloud service providers. So, you know, S3 buckets and, and on Azure. And, and so just understanding where all the information was seems like a very simple question, but very complex on the operational side on the back end to be able to do that. And it was all manual and time consuming today. And so, uh, so what they did is that 
once they implemented some of the processes that we just talked about with Okta and OneTrust working together, they were able to eliminate all the fraudulent requests. They had greater accuracy on the data that they did retrieve. So they were able to retrieve from their backend systems and pull a greater amount of information back to those end customers. And they were also able to, to automate a lot of the back end on that consumer rights process and re reduce a lot of their labor. And so, uh, so that's kind of a real world example where you see the power of OneTrust and Okta working together. So here real quickly, I wanted to just show you uh, just a very quick demo uh, on this as well. And so I'll pull this uh, short demo up and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Welcome to this OneTrust video where I'll be demoing how OneTrust can integrate with Okta through OpenID Connect to leverage an existing Okta user login to submit a consumer rights request. And the use case here is the ability to leverage an existing user login in Okta, have an option on the web form to log into an existing Okta account and pre-populate web form attributes. A consumer rights request is received in OneTrust and a ID verification method is automatically created on the consumer rights request. And I'll be walking you through the setup process starting with configuring a web form in OneTrust and then creating a single page application in Okta. And the first step is to create a web form in OneTrust with the relevant subject type, request type, and form fields. And then in the verification tab of the web form, you will need to toggle on the enable authentication on web form button. And the last step is to create a single page application in Okta, and you will need to edit the application configuration with the information from the OneTrust web form. And now we'll get into the integration demo. We'll start with logging in with an existing Okta account, and then show the automated pre-population of web form attributes upon successful login. We'll then receive the request in OneTrust, and finally show the creation of the ID verification method on the request. So here I have the web form sign-in page, and if I click on sign-in, I will be redirected to Okta for authentication. And then I'll sign in with my existing Okta account. And click sign in. And upon successful login, I will be redirected to the OneTrust web form. And the web form will be automatically pre-populated with the user's information from Okta. And I'll be submitting a customer info request and fill out the remaining information. So I'll click on customer info request and click submit. And once the web form is submitted, there will be a new consumer request created within the OneTrust system. And a ID verification method for Okta is automatically created on the consumer request. And for more information, please visit my.onetrust.com. Thank you for watching. Great, thank you so much. All right, so very quickly, uh, if you look at, here's where really Okta and OneTrust make the whole process of privacy and consent simpler for you. So. Our approach to CCPA and data privacy is simple. So CCPA forces you to rethink as a company, how do you manage those consumer rights and how do you leverage that as an engagement strategy for your customers? And then the power of really kind of leveraging your investments in Okta and OneTrust already to then streamline that consent management and the user experience for you. So uh, if you're interested to learn more, uh, we'd love to be able to talk to you. Once again, my name is Jeff Barnett. Uh, my information is here on the screen. Uh, feel free to reach out to me directly or visit our website uh, at onetrust.com. And we'll be happy to uh, share some more information about you and show you how we can kind of bring value into your Okta environment as well. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for listening. And uh, we'll talk to you later.